master. In this episode, museum hacker and cocktail party master Nick Gray and I came up with a few sketch ideas. To the museum, right? right. Yes. Uh, what if it was a thousand visits to like the world's largest ball of twine? How would you go about making the world's largest ball of twine a really interesting tour, right? Oh, interesting. Well, I like to know how much things cost for myself. Yeah. And so I would want to try to, you know, put it up on auction for eBay. It is a party within a party. Within that party, you decide, oh, I need to have another party. So you have another party within the party. And it's just like partyception. I love that idea. I love that idea because I often talk about the concept of a party within a party. Like yeah. what would be the most uncomfortable icebreakers you could come up with at a party that would get people not only to slow down, but like, genuinely like freak out like what are those icebreakers and then how okay. that would play out i like that idea but i have to veto that idea because for any listeners they're always worried about what can go wrong with their party which one did we pick you'll find out on this episode of it's a sketch comedy podcast show Welcome to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, the one-of-a-kind show where I, Stuart Rice, invite interesting people to have intriguing conversations and then improvise a comedy sketch based on what we talked about. It's the only show like it on the internet. And this week's guest is fantastic. In fact, he helped me make friends and solidify more friends just by inviting them over to my house for a cocktail party. That's right, Nick Gray specializes in two hour cocktail parties. It's not gonna take the whole night, it's just gonna take part of the night. Everybody wants more, which is exactly what a good party does. But that's not all Nick does. He's also a museum hacker, and we'll find out more about that as well. So without any further ado, let's get right into the conversation with my friend, Nick Gray. Nick, thanks for joining us today. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're here, too. Hey, I've got a really quick question for you. What Maybe. makes you interesting? I am obsessed with name tags, and I've hosted hundreds of parties. Also, in my past life, I've been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art more than a thousand times. Uh, did you miss something there, or what, what was the reason <laughs> for going for a thousand times? I used to have a business called Museum Hack, and we did renegade museum tours where we would hire people like stand-up comedians and Broadway actors to lead these museum tours. And I was the first tour guide myself. So in the first years of starting the business, I was there almost every single day. So you would, you, why, why, what's wrong with the uh, tours that people had? What's wrong with the Metropolitan's normal tour? You know what? For a free museum tour, they do really good job, but they are also led by volunteers and they tend to be more focused on the narratives of art history that maybe the average tourist doesn't really care about. And so my company, we would tell people the juicy gossip about the art, how it was acquired, how much things cost, all the stuff that you wouldn't hear from the official museum tour. The things you actually want to know so that you can go and have like, if you were to go to a cocktail party afterwards, for instance, you yes. could actually have a conversation about it and bring up something interesting that nobody had maybe heard before. Exactly like that. The stuff that you would tell your friends. Okay. All right. That's cool. That's cool. And, uh, and why, why did you do that? Um, I started to go to the museum. You know, I live in um, Austin, Texas now. Where are you based out of? Uh, Denver, Colorado. Nice. Denver's awesome. My sister and my parents live up there. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, it's good. Um, I moved to New York and I was go I lived in Brooklyn at the time. And, you know, I didn't know a lot of people. I didn't have many friends. And I went, somebody brought me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This woman brought me there on a date. And I was like, oh. This place is amazing. I feel like I moved to New York for stuff like this. I should hang out here more. Um, and so I started to go there. And then I went there a lot. And when friends would come to visit, I would bring them there. And I'd give them little tours just to show them like cool stuff I found. And it became something I really loved. And I did it as a hobby. And then, you know what? A blog wrote about us called Daily Candy that was real big. Um, and said it was the best thing to do in New York City, that my secret tours were like the best thing in New York. And literally overnight, 
1300 people emailed me wanting to join one of the tours and i was like oh god i this is big so yeah, <laughs> that's kind of how i started that's uh that's how i feel about this podcast is that uh you know a couple people uh listened and then they told nobody but anyway um <laughs> that was cool <laughs> that was what it was the whole idea was hopefully people talk anyway <laughs> um that's awesome. And uh, is it just in New York or is it other places as well? So I started the business in about 2013 officially, but I've been doing it for two years as a hobby. And then we we branched out to more major museums all around America. So the Metropolitan Museum, we we're in the National Gallery in D.C. We we're at the Getty in Los Angeles. Um, it grew to about five or six cities. I sold the company in 2019 and they've gone through some changes through the group tour plan scheduling and lockdowns and COVID and things like that. But it really is. It's an awesome business. Yeah, it sounds. I wish I lived in a city that had one because I would love to go. But it gives me a reason to go to L.A., I guess. There's really no other reason. But there's a good a museum reason. out in Denver. There's the Denver Art Museum. I yeah, think. Denver Art Museum collection. Great. And yeah. then I think in Denver, is there like a natural history museum with some cool dinosaur stuff? I think I went to that. I. I don't know if that's here in Utah. I haven't been around. I'm relatively yeah. new to Denver. I'm actually from Portland, but. Oh, I think you might be right. I think it might be in Utah. Yeah, yeah but same, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah same thing. Uh, <laughs> um, and was the museum thing like that was what you obviously started a business off of just kind of like a gag thing that you were doing, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Was that your first business that you ever started? I actually, I, I, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial household. My dad was always like a mad scientist trying to come up with these crazy ideas. And so I had, I think my first business was a lawn care service company. What, what young man doesn't start a lawn care service company that has the itch for entrepreneurship? I wash windows. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, really? How, yeah. how, how, what'd you do? Uh, oh, I went to people's houses. Hey, would you like your windows washed? That's, That's pretty cool. Yeah, I did that for a couple of years. That's nice. Would you ever climb up on ladders to do like? I would, which was foolish. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of spiders, a lot of wasps. That's what I'll say. I've never met somebody who's done a window washing company, but I think it's genius because everybody has the other stuff. But nobody's gonna jump up to wash their windows on the second floor, things Hell like that. No. Mm -mm. Um, I had anyway, a web sorry. hosting company in high, er, in high school, in college. I tried to start a software company that was a big failure. But yeah, I always, I've been noodling on this stuff for a long time. Oh, that's cool. Um, and you said your, fa your family, your dad was big into uh, entrepreneurship. Yes. Um, yeah. And that was, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you did something with airplanes, correct? Yes. Yes, he okay. started in the basement of our house a business that had it made that map, you know, that shows where the plane is flying across the world. Yeah. And he made that for small jets because you could buy it, but it was for like Delta Airlines and things like that. And he's like, oh, I think I can take a computer and some software and build this for small planes. Um, and so he made that happen. And my mom joined and then I joined after college and helped them hire some of their first employees. I did their marketing and their sales. And we really grew the business together to about almost 80 employees before selling that in 2014. That's awesome. All right. Well, um, now all you want to do is party, right? Now you I'm may... obsessed with parties. I'm going to try to convince you to host a party. Well, I don't think it's going to take much convincing because I, after reading a little bit about what you were talking about, it became fascinating. Uh, it's actually the reason I have you on the show is because I think it's such a good idea that I want to get, I want to get in ears of other people. So yeah. what, what is a two hour cocktail party and why is it a necessity for us? A two hour cocktail party. All right. So what's the gist of it? Let me think about this for your listeners that maybe have never hosted before or only host birthday parties or something like that. Think about how your life would be different if you had a full social calendar, if you had people inviting you to fun things, if you had a rich and robust network of acquaintances that really set up new introductions for you. So what if instead of trying to meet new people, people were just coming into your life with ease? When you start to host parties, that's what life can be like. Um, that's what I learned from moving to New York. I didn't really know many people. 
I wasn't successful going out to clubs or networking events. And so I decided to bring the party to me. And through hosting hundreds and hundreds of parties and teaching over 100 people how to host their own well-run event, we found like a formula, if you will, that could make a party successful. And it might not be what you think, because so, sometimes the advice is counterintuitive. But I'll pause to ask you first, anything resonate? And then there, have you hosted anything recently and what went well about it? Yeah, recently I haven't. Now, I used to do parties and I used to do uh, for for my job, I would host events and do all of that. And I mean, I, I don't know if there's an X factor I because I didn't read the book, but there were certain things that I always tried to have going on in the party to make sure it was very interesting. I think the last one I the last major one I did was actually my own funeral when I turned Whoa, 40. Tell me what? This sounds amazing. Yeah. So for my 40th birthday, I decided to uh, host a funeral as opposed to a party because it was like the death of my youth. Right. Like that. I felt like I was transitioning. So I got a coffin in in. Portland, they have a place called Voodoo Donuts. You could get a coffin. They custom made a coffin filled with donuts. So instead of cake, I did that. And then I had people come and eulogize me. And it was great. It was, it was, a, it was an interesting take on a birthday party. And uh, people seem to really like it. So I, I know that there's like always that like little bit of an X factor, but it's hard to figure out what that X factor is. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it that's going to get people engaged in the party, mix together, do something together? And it sounds like you maybe have figured it out. And I think that that's, I mean, take the easy route by the book, right? I, yeah, yeah. I found one formula that works. I love with your funeral that you had your friends eulogize you. I read something <sighs> that said that. We shouldn't wait for funerals to read mm -mm. eulogies for our friends, you know? Let's no, celebrate my, them. My daughter roasted me so hard. She had built a PowerPoint presentation no way. to just destroy me. It was wonderful. That's yeah. pretty funny that she yeah. roasted you. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if you actually died and she was like roasting you at the actual funeral? That would be incredible. My hope is that, that that is exactly what happens. That would be the best thing possible. That would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. What what worked well with that event that you hosted, it sounds like it was truly something special and you were celebrating a major life event with a major life party. And you probably spent a lot of money and people spent a lot of time planning and preparing for that. And I think those parties are great and fantastic. They also, however, prohibit us from hosting regularly because mm -hmm. the, the biggest benefits come when you can learn how to make hosting a habit, something that you do regularly where you always have your next event on the calendar. Imagine you're in Denver and you meet somebody interesting at the park, at the grocery store, at a stand-up event, whatever you can invite them to your next party. It's the it's the easiest thing to just say, hey, I'm hosting a cocktail party. Can I invite you to it or send you the information? So I have a very simple formula. And if it's easy to think about it, like with my name, because my name is Nick, N-I-C-K. And so all the letters, can I say what all the letters are? Please do. N stands for name tags. Everyone at the party has a name tag. This is a hill that I will die on. I think even if you think they sound formal, I'll try to convince you why they're helpful, even for a party in the neighborhood with your friends that you think know each other. I stands for icebreakers. You lead two, two and a half icebreakers at your party, and those are meant just to encourage new conversations. It's not about what people say during the icebreakers, that's what they say after the icebreakers. Uh, C stands for cocktails only. So no dinner, and even if you don't drink alcohol, I don't drink, but the idea of a cocktail party is a lightweight social gathering. So no dinner, that's important, no dinner. And then K stands for kick them out at the end. It's only a two hour party. And I can talk about how you can actually kick people out at the end, but that's important. This is only two hours long and you're gonna host it on a Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday night. That's really important. So that's the gist. It's an easy, lightweight, very efficient social gathering that I've found can really help. It's how I launched my last business. It's how I launched my book by building up this network of relationships because we find out about some of the best things in life, whether it's new podcast guests, new business opportunities, new relationships, not through our very best friends, but through our network of acquaintances, weak ties, loose connections. That's what these parties are all about. 
acquaintances seem to be like that seems to be the go-to relationship that most people have with other people like mm. most people are just acquaintances right well because you yeah. can't have close friends with everybody um and i what why are how do we make acquaintances more important for ourselves because obviously we're going to gain some by doing these two-hour cocktail parties but like wh why are they important to have i like acquaintances because i think they are easy connections to get to know somebody to see if you want to develop a deeper relationship and so I talk in my book about building big relationships. And you have to remember that you can't go from stranger to best friend. There's a, there's a friendship funnel, so to speak, that you would go through. And it's from being a stranger to knowing someone, to having a conversation, to becoming an acquaintance. And then through a couple hangouts, maybe you can become friends. And oftentimes, if you meet somebody and you're like, oh, I want to get to know this person, What's your default there? Like if you meet somebody interesting and want to get to know them, what do you do now? Oh, yeah. Well, I usually I, I'm so unique in that I'm like, hey, let's go get coffee, uh, <laughs> you know, or hey, is there a band coming to town? Do you want to go see them or yeah. something along those lines? But yeah, the, that's usually some sort of in a go someplace and meet someplace and do something. I like what you do with the band there where you can invite someone to something interesting. Yeah. Oftentimes, you know, especially for busy people, it can be very hard for us to schedule to meet up one on one to go have coffee with someone. You may think it's only a 30 minute coffee, but when you consider drive and commute and scheduling, it works out to being about one or two hours from mm -hmm. an individual's time calendar. I found that hosting a cocktail party was an easy, efficient way that I could add value to someone. Right. So I can give them something first. And what am I giving them? I'm giving them an uh, invitation and an opportunity to meet a ton of new folks. And so that's how I would lead. If I'm trying to make a connection, I say, hey, I host these cocktail parties where I bring together half people I know and half new interesting people that I've met here in town. Would you like to come sometime? And that's exciting, right? Because most adults don't make new friends. As we get older, it's so much harder to it's meet It's impossible. New Why is it so difficult to meet new people? As an adult, like as a, as a kid on the playground, you just kind of go up and go, hi, my name's Stewie. Like, you know, like, what, yeah. let's go play on the slide. And then all of a sudden right. that's your best friend for the day. Right. We don't get right. that now. Yeah. Why can't life be like, hey, look at this cool rock I found. It looks yeah. like a potato. Can we be friends? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to try that so too. <laughs> right. <laughs> just carry around a potato rock. For many people, you know, their their number of friendships and connections really peaked when they were in college or university. And it tends to go down after that. As we move, friendships become like a game of attrition. We get older, we have kids, we get a job, we move out to the suburbs, and it's just harder to meet people, which is funny because we need those relationships more as we get older. And I don't exactly know the why behind it, but I can tell you that most Americans haven't made a new friend in over three years. And that especially among men, there is a bit of a loneliness problem. I read a stat that said that like 17% of men say they don't have a single close friendship, which is crazy and it's wild. And it's the reason that I wanted to share my book was just to help people make more friends and build these relationships because I got so much value from it. It changed my life. I think it could change anyone. Oh, I absolutely agree with you. Actually, I, I've had... I think even on the show, we've had discussions about how men don't have good close relationships. Intimacy yeah. is a big issue for men. So, yeah, why uh, is that? What do you think? Uh, I think it's because there is a, um, we get uncomfortable when we start to like pull down the facades and yeah. it, it's really uncomfortable. And it, traditionally, especially, maybe specifically here in America. I don't know. I don't have an experience anywhere else, but I think that we associate like sensitivity to intimacy and that that's more of a female trait. And so that we tend to, as guys, we yeah. tend to shy away from those things. And so what ends up happening is with, uh, with relationships with other men, it's just, it's such a surface thing that once you get past that, it's like, all right, now what? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go. To, let's go to a football game. You know, that's kind of we bond around football, sports, things of like that nature. But if you talk to women and or you're around women that have conversations, they don't talk about things like that. I mean, they'll talk about our dicks, but like they'll talk about other things as well. Like they'll talk about feelings and whatnot. Yeah. It's interesting how we do, we definitely do different things as gender. There was a sales guy who I used to work with. He was a huge mentor to me. And we were talking about friendships and things like that. And he said, yeah, some of my best friends, now that I think about it, you know, these guys that he rides motorcycles with every weekend, he said, I don't even know their last names. I couldn't tell you very much about their personal lives, but I'd say they're some of my best friends. And I think that it is kind of interesting. I hear from people like my parents, I made them read my book, right? Because it's like I'm their son, they have to. Sure. I tried um, to make I, my parents read my book and they set it on the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if my parents read all of my book, but this, I made them read my book and now I'm on this mission to get 500 people to read my book and, and host a party for their friends and neighbors. And I count every single one. I try to talk to them the day after their party. And my parents hosted one for their neighbors and they said, look, we... It's so funny. We walk around the neighborhood and you have these little two minute conversations with the neighbors and you say, oh, we should go out. We should have dinner. But, you know, as life works out, we usually don't. And they got to meet so many of their neighbors beyond just having that simple little conversation. And they got to do something generous by bringing them over to their home, inviting them inside and having a drink and some snacks that they bought at Walmart or Costco or something. Yeah, it's usually it, Costco. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not about your house, by the way, for uh, for any listeners that are like, oh, I don't have a nice house. I live too far away. My apartment's small. I hosted hundreds of these parties in my tiny studio apartment in New York City. Sometimes the smaller space is actually better because the energy is electric. This guy, Noah, who lives in Chicago, he's 28. He read my book and he has like a 400 square foot apartment and he hosted. He had 28 people inside, which is crazy. The perfect number that I've found is between 15 and 20 for a first time or new host. That's really the number that you want to have. And then what, when you're in this party, do you, uh, is it your job as the host to like go around and mingle? Is that, is that what you're supposed to do? Generally, you as the host have a couple duties. Number one yeah. is you're going to make sure everybody has a name tag. So your first mm-hmm. 10 or 20 minutes as everybody's arriving, you're welcoming them and you're giving them a name tag. Your other major duty as a host is to run two and a half rounds of um, um, icebreakers. And those icebreakers are very easy, but you do have to do a little bit of public speaking because you Mm -hmm. have everybody stop the party, which can be intimidating. So I coach people how to do that. Do you have like a record scratch that you just play? You know, like everybody go. (laughs) You're going to laugh at me, but I actually use a small harmonica. I'm looking around my desk. I don't have one. And I make a little tone. I don't play. I don't know how to play it, but I just blow out similar to using like a train whistle to make a noise as I turn the music down. And I have helped so many people host their first party. And I can't tell you of all my party formula. It's the one that gets ridiculed and made fun of the most on one hand. And then after the first party, people are like, why did I not get the harmonica? It's genius because it's such a quirky, cute little sound instead of yelling at everybody hey everybody everybody be quiet which is and not everybody has house. a triangle that they can hit or like yes. one of those little tone things do do a gong you know yeah 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 a gong would be kind of cool though a, that would definitely would get be... some attention <laughs> right but anyhow your job as the host is just to lead these little rounds of icebreakers and what you do is you ask everybody to say their name to say what they do for work. If they don't want to talk about work, they can talk about a hobby. And then you ask them an icebreaker question. And the question that I like that I recommend everybody uses at the start of a party is what I call a green level icebreaker. And that's because there's no rapport built up. People are not loose. They're, They're still rigid. So a green level icebreaker is a fast one that doesn't require a lot of thought or judgment. The one that I like is What is one of your favorite things to eat for breakfast? What's your go-to that you do more often than not? And I like that because there's no judgment about it. I'm not asking people, oh, say an interesting fact about yourself. (laughs) I'm not 
putting people on the spot, hopefully. And so that's a good one that works 100% of the time. And who doesn't eat breakfast occasionally or right? wish they could eat breakfast occasionally, right? Right, yeah. right, right. Or yeah. if they skip breakfast, if they do intermittent fasting, then just say about that. I hosted a party uh, a couple of years ago in New York and there was this woman there dressed in all black, tall, skinny. She was older. She looked like she was like raised by street rats. Um, and she came to my party and she's like, my name is Diane. I'm a writer. And for breakfast, I like to have cigarettes. And it just broke the ice. And everybody, it was very funny. It was very funny. And it just kind of put things in perspective. And memorable, too. Like, that's a that's a memorable response to that question. Like, what good. do you like for breakfast? Cigarettes. You know, like, that's right? great. It was yeah. so good. It was great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I start this show with a very uncomfortable question. Like I said, I yeah. told you I was going to ask you. That's yeah. probably not a very good opening question for uh, a, a cocktail party, correct? What makes you interesting is a great question. I like that you use it. Yeah. In thinking about a social situation, you know, you're having high profile people who who come on the podcast and you want to capture your listeners' attention right away. Right. If I were to bring somebody into my home, I often think about what that experience is like for those that are socially awkward, have a little bit of anxiety or aren't like an extrovert, maybe like you and I. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to create just a welcome, easy environment to warm people up for that two hour journey. Yeah, I, th I think it's brilliant. Um, yeah, uh, in business, we use. A, I was a sales guy for a very long time, and so like icebreakers are like a, it's a it's a lifeboat, really, because like uh -huh. there are times when you're in a situation you're like I need to get everybody engaged, I need to get yeah. everybody starting to talk to each other. How do I do that? And icebreakers are great, and you always get the one jokester that's gonna you know do their own thing, and it's kind of wonderful because then uh -huh. it takes a lot of the the heat off of you as far as making sure things are things are going. So, um, all right. So it sounds like, uh, everybody needs to, to host a cocktail party, um, up on the screen. That's where you can go to get the book. And I think people should definitely do that. Now, besides hosting parties and, and, uh, doing those types of things, what, what other types of things are you into? Um, for fun, I live in um, Austin, Texas, and we have this weird thing here called Barton Springs Pool. It's a natural spring-fed aquifer pool. I don't know how to describe it because there's no lanes, but it's just enormous. It's like three acres, and I like to swim in that. I live about five minutes from it, so that's something that's fun that good. I like to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, I live a lot of my life online, so I have a blog. I do social media. I've, I've been blogging for... 20 plus years. And so I actually get so much fun and joy out of writing. Like I have this thing called my friend's newsletter where I send a newsletter to my friends of just cool movies I've seen or uh, fun stuff I've read, cool links, memes, things like that. So that really does make me happy. I like to do that. Yeah, that's... Um do you do a lot of social media? Is that a, oh, tons, a thing? Tons, tons, tons of social I, media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm huge. Is there is there a particular social media that you like really kind of gravitate to, or do you try to just equally split your time between them? Um, these days, at the time of this recording, I'm spending more time thinking about growing an audience on um, TikTok. So I hired a firm to help me with that. Um, I do my own Twitter, um, Instagram. I do a lot on Instagram Stories because it's it's easy and it's a throwaway. Yeah. So for me, I'd say, yeah, that's the one I do the most. Okay. All right. And then, um, I, obviously you had, uh, was it Donna that ate the cigarettes in the morning <laughs> or yes. had cigarettes yeah. in the morning? Okay. So obviously it worked, right? What was there? Um, have you ever had a party that didn't go as well as you had hoped? Is there, I, is there a situation where that's happened? Yeah. Huge. Um, one, one that I can think about was one where I think it was a Monday night and I decided I'm like, Oh, let's have friends over on Wednesday or Thursday. And I didn't give myself enough planning, what I call the um, party runway. And I just mass message, you know, 20 or 30 people. Hey everybody, I'm having people over come by anytime from five to 10 PM. And I did a couple things wrong there. One, I didn't give people enough notice. Two, I didn't do individualized invitations. Nobody felt special. And three, I left this awkward, enormous time block. Oh, five to ten. Like, what time do you 10. show up? Right, right. Swing by yeah. any time. Has that ever happened? Do you get invited to a barbecue on a Saturday at four? 
and you're like, okay, well, they, they said four, so I guess I'll show up at five, but the hosts are, you know, from this place, so actually they want us to show up two hours. You do this mental sort of calculus of what time to actually arrive. And that's one major thing that I'd say for your listeners is that doing that two hour time block gets people to show up on time and boosts your attendance rate because people know that, look, this is a tight time. I don't have to stay too late if I want to leave. And it gives them an excuse to leave. People love the excuse to leave, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Irish goodbye, which yes. is like you just kind of throw down the Batman, you know, smoke pill and yes. leave. And nobody knows that you were there. No one knows. I, I am a huge fan of it. And I, I absolutely hate the like long goodbyes in a, at a party. It's like, oh, yeah. I've got to go say goodbye to ho- so-and-so and so-and-so. And it's like, you just met them. Like, just leave. Get out. <laughs> you I, know? Totally agree. Yeah. And I'm also a big fan of name tags. I think that that is, it, it cuts down the amount of mental bandwidth people have to deal with when they, uh, when they don't have to remember your name, they can just look at your, your tag and, and just know who you are. It's kind of great. It's easy, right? I'd it's rather super make people, easy. <laughs> I'd rather feel a little uncomfortable asking someone to wear a name tag than feel uncomfortable all night long forgetting their name. Yeah, so absolutely. that's why I do it. I also think it's more inclusive. I mean, I don't want to sound super woke, but think about what the experience is like for a significant other or for a plus one. You have a best friend. He just starts dating someone and he brings her along to the party. She doesn't know anybody. She doesn't know your friend group. And when you do name tags, it just makes everybody feel a little more included. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been great. Um, I, 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 I mean, I'm excited about hosting a party. I will definitely. Wait, so, so are you going to do it? Can I? Can I don't know. You can you? count on me to do it. I will buy the book today. We're going to send, I'm going to send you a copy of the book. One. Okay. All right. And then two, while we're on the call now, I want, yeah. well, I guess we could wait if you want to, but I want you to look at your calendar and I want you to Let's choose a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night that is ideally four or more weeks away. Now, yeah. because it may take me a week to send you the book, maybe choose five because we don't want to butt up against uh, Halloween. Halloween's what I call a red level day. You don't want to host around major holidays, events, three day weekends. Those are red level. And why? Why do we do Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday night? Because people are available. And the number one success is if you can have a full list of attendees. Number one fear someone has is nobody will show up. And when you host on a Monday, or Tuesday or Wednesday night. So what day do you think would be good? November 1st. November 1st. I love it's a Tuesday. that Tuesday. Yeah. That's a Tuesday. It's the day after Halloween. So do you think that that's okay? Is that too much? Is that too close? I don't know. I don't well, know. Let's, go, let's um, do that Wednesday. That's that Wednesday. Works. Wednesday. Perfect. Wednesday yeah. the 2nd. So the next thing to think about is what two-hour time block would you do? 6 to 8, uh, 7 to 9, 5 to Yeah, seven, probably eight. that 6 to 8. Yeah. 6 to 8. Great. The next thing is that think about which five people you would invite that's part of what I call your core group. These are your close friends, people Mm -hmm. that if only they showed up, you'd be happy. So I want you to think about who those five are. And when we get off this recording, you're going to text those five people and say, hey, I'm thinking I just had this guest on. I'm thinking of hosting this thing called a two hour cocktail party on Wednesday, November 2nd from 6 to 8 p.m. And here's the thing. You'll say, if I do it, would you come? Okay. Oh, that's a good line. And your if goal, I do it, would you? Co- yeah, I like it. All right. Your goal is to get five people who will say yes. Okay. And so you'll text people until you get those five yeses. You may hear from them. Oh no, 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 that's too close to Halloween. I can't do it. You know. And so then, if that happens, then just move your date. Right. Just like choose it another week afterwards, and you send the same message. You're going to hunt for those five yeses. And I have a feeling for you, it'll be pretty easy. And when you get those five yeses, then your party's happening. We'll make a simple page online to collect their RSVPs. My book will tell you exactly what to write and all that, all the scripts, exactly how to invite more people. And then it'll be a success. All you have to do is like one or two hours of work at the beginning. And then your party will be a huge success. I love it. I cannot wait. I'm actually very excited about it because I, you know, I'm new to Denver. I've yeah. been here just, I've been here over a year, but I guess it's not overly new, but I still don't know tons and tons of people because COVID kind of screwed us up as far as like meeting people, I think. 
I anyway. think you're exactly right. It's yeah. made it hard and people are a little more awkward. So number one, they appreciate an invite to something like this where you're gonna bring different groups, Stuart, from, from this social group. I'll bring a couple people from this, this, this. And then uh, basically they also need guidelines. They need guardrails to have a little yeah. social interaction. Love it, love it. All right, well, we've got this planned. I'm very excited about that. We do have to record a sketch, though. So Yes, please. Nick, that was fantastic. Now, do me a favor. Tell everybody how they can get a hold of your book and how they can learn more about you. Please. So my name is Nick Gray. I have a book called The Two Hour Cocktail Party. It has over 230 reviews on Amazon. And it sounds like I'm selling something, but I'm just trying to get people to make more friends. And if you check out my book, I'll give you a satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, you can Venmo request me for a refund. I think the book is packed with actionable tips and a step-by-step -step guide, including the scripts, exactly what to say, and a minute-by-minute -minute breakdown of what to do at your party. I think we can all use a new friend. So check it out and stay in touch. Let me just say, my cocktail party was fantastic, and I cannot wait to have another one. And now our sketch. A cocktail party in a cocktail party in a cocktail party in a cocktail party in three, two, Welcome everybody, administrative announcement. Welcome to my cocktail party. I'm so glad, wow, we have 15 or 20 people here. I just moved to Denver, so it's great to meet everybody. And we're gonna go around the room, we're gonna do a quick icebreaker, say your name, say what you do for work or something fun, and then one of your favorite things to eat for breakfast. Stuart, would you be willing to go first? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, yeah, my name's Stuart, um, and uh, I, I host this silly podcast thing that I like to do. Um, and then for, for breakfast, I really actually like uh, Eggs Benedict is my favorite, but I don't get it as often as I'd like, but I love Eggs Benedict. I love Eggs Benedict. I also like hollandaise sauce. Hey, that gives me an idea. If you like Eggs Benedict or if you've ever bathed in hollandaise sauce like Stuart and I, come and meet us in this corner over here. We're going to do a VIP hollandaise meetup. So check us out afterwards. All right, listen up. This is the hollandaise meetup group. And I was looking around at this party and these other chums don't know the benefits of Eggs Benedict. So I thought we'd have a little VIP hollandaise party within the party. What do you guys think about that? I, I don't understand why anybody doesn't love Eggs Benedict. It's amazing that there were six of us that actually came out and said for breakfast, it was Eggs Benedict that was the thing. I think it's really cool that all of us like joined up like this. These six of us really are the VIP party within the party. I think it's so cool that actually, Randall, you happen to have brought hollandaise sauce with you. Do you guys want to take a shot of hollandaise sauce? I'll go get some shot glasses. Yeah, never leave home without it. Any volunteers who would make a toast to hollandaise sauce? Anyone want to say what they love most about either Eggs Benedict or hollandaise or just a favorite memory that you've had with hollandaise sauce? My name's Nancy. I guess I, I, if it's okay, I would love to share my story about Eggs Benedict. Yeah, Nancy, please, can we get a round of applause for Nancy willing to step up and share her holidays testimonial. Nancy, the stage is yours. So when I was a little girl, my, uh, my parents actually were like fundamental Christians and they didn't believe in holiday sauce. Oh. And so when I was older, I, I had a friend I stayed the night and then the next day we went to Denny's for breakfast and uh, I saw that they had hollandaise sauce on the Eggs Benedict and I got it and it was the most delicious thing I had ever eaten. It was like the forbidden fruit of breakfast. Baptized by hollandaise. Who among us has not had that moment? I think that's really cool. By the way, if you have been baptized by hollandaise sauce, Meet us over in this other corner because we're going to do a VIP of the VIP. So I'll see you over there. Do you think we're in competition now? I don't know. Are we in competition? What do you think? I don't know. I don't think we're really in competition. 
All right, welcome to the Church of Hollandaise. Uh, I'm curious, can we do another round of icebreakers? Maybe someone here would volunteer to say your name and I guess just something that you dream about. I'd love to hear that. Hank, you met me earlier. You know, I was I was talking about how I go and work out a lot. You said that you liked Eggs Benedict because you'll get in a heavy lift day and then you'll just pound about 10 pounds, I think you said, of eggs. And then just to break it up a little, you add the hollandaise. I don't know. I'd just love to hear what do you like? What do you dream about? Uh, well, I don't actually like dream at night. I, I take these uh, pills to help me sleep. Yeah. So I guess I'm not re really the right person to, to talk to about this. Right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I remember you handing those pills out a few minutes ago, and I cautioned you against doing that. And I'm glad that we're all here to think about our dreams as it relates to church or hollandaise sauce or just eggs benedict. We all celebrate that. Hey, um, uh, it's Stuart again. I do have a dream, I, if yeah. it's okay if I interject. Oh, yeah, please, Stuart, let's hear it. Okay, so uh, my dream is that I can quit my day job and just do my podcast on a daily basis. Like, that's kind of my dream. We can help you achieve that dream, and I love that dream, too, is that if you like the Sketch Comedy Podcast show, if you'll leave a review, because every review helps Stuart get a little bit closer to his dreams. And that's really what it's all about, right? Following our dreams. You know, one other idea would be if we could get a Hollandaise mint brand to actually sponsor this show. I think that'd be amazing. That would be amazing. If you have a podcast, um, go and chat there with Stuart. But if you don't have a podcast, go over to this area and we're going to do actually a VIP within the VIP within the VIP. So meet me over there in a minute. I'll see you there. All right, welcome, welcome everybody. Well, you've arrived here because of life decisions. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? My name's Earl. I know like the TV show. I don't have a podcast. I don't, I don't really have a lot of friends. I don't really have a lot going on in my life, but I appreciate you bringing me to this party. Earl, welcome. It is so great to meet you. I remember seeing you in the neighborhood and I invited you to come over. You are welcome here and it's it's helpful that we all have name tags so we can make some new friends. Uh, what is your dream, Earl? Do you have a dream? Is there something that you want to do or accomplish in life? My dream is to help others really find their internal like drive and, and move forward in their life and 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 just be very very successful your dream is to help people be more successful and find their internal compass their their north star of sorts i like that what would you say is a good way to do that have you ever heard of amway Thank you so much for joining us for Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. We hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. And now for a little legal ease. Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is protected under Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 4.0 International License. What does that mean? It means if you want to use any part of the show, please contact the show so we can get you a good audio recording of it. And until next time, I hope you go out and create a comedy improv adventure of your own. Okay. Well, I think what could go right, <laughs> go with, the right with the party? Like, okay. Like, for example, like what if it became like a 24 hour party? Like, like what would happen if everybody at the party decided to just get in the car and go drive on a road trip that night or go to the airport together and drive? Like, like what would happen if the party went right? Oh wow! That yeah, that's like that sounds like a uh, a movie, yes. <laughs> like like a road trip movie. That'd be fantastic.